On behalf of the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Gold Coast City, I welcome you all to this evening's talk. Many of you have already attended a number of these information evenings, and many of you will be here attending for the first time. These information evenings have been organized to stimulate thought and inquiry into the principles of the Baha'i faith and also to explore issues of relevance to society and present the Baha'i perspective. Some of the topics that have already been covered during these information evenings range from the equality of opportunity for men and women, justice, is spirituality a solution to the economic ills of society, just to name a few. Tonight's topic will explore the complex but vital interaction between spirituality and health, well-being, and the science of medicine. It is hoped that the format of this evening will connect and engage interactive and meaningful dialogue. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Arman Sabet, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you. Dr. Arman Sabet is a senior staff specialist at the Gold Coast University Hospital and the former director of neurology. Dr. Sabet completed his medical degree and neurology training in the United States before moving to Australia, where he is now a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Dr. Sabet is an associate professor of neurology at the Griffith University, where he is involved in medical education and clinical research. Also serves as a member of the local spiritual assembly the local governing body of the Baha'is of the Gold Coast. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sabet. Good evening, dear friends. Um, thank you, uh, dear Mariam, for a kind, wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, attending this evening. And uh, also, I would like to thank the local spiritual assembly of uh, Gold Coast City for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you about a topic that has been of interest and uh, especially as a uh, what Mariam June said as a doctor uh, we come across issues of spirituality and medicine uh, so uh, it would be a good opportunity to uh, uh, discuss that a bit. Before I uh, proceed I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land that we meet on and pay respect to uh, their elders past present and emerging. I'd like to also like to uh, make a uh, disclosure that um, I will be talking and uh, reading many quotes from uh, the Baha'i scriptures, but what is discussed outside of that is uh, strictly an opinion of one person, and it does not reflect the views of the uh, institution of the Baha'i faith, and uh, just to uh, make that uh, distinction. Now, I'd like to start with a story. Um, you know, there are medical journals that most of uh, physicians uh, subscribe to and read, and we use these journals as a way of communicating with each other. These are journals that new findings, research studies, uh, trials that have been conducted are published in, and we use that to keep up to date with what occurs in our field of medicine. But every once in a while, there are topics and articles published in these journals that are a bit outside of day-to-day -day scientific uh, investigations and trials. And they address issues such as spirituality or humanities or ethics. And there are not many of them, but occasionally these are just put in through the, uh, through the scientific journals. And one of those is a story that I'd like to read to you, if you may. Um, a couple of years ago, I was on a plane ride. I can't remember where I was going, probably to a meeting of some sort. And usually I take these journals with me. That's when you know, it's the best time to catch up on your reading. You're not interrupted by phones and pages and other distractions. So I came across this story. It was published 
in Journal of uh, Neurology, which is a journal that is uh, published by American Academy of Neurology and probably is one of the mostly widely spread uh, journals within the field of neurology. So that is Journal, uh, journal of Neurology is published by uh, a neurologist that uh, ex uh, explains his experience with uh, one uh, patient that uh, he had a few years prior. So here it goes. There are memories that fade as soon as they are born, and there are memories that stay forever. Details become a bit vague, but we are changed, and they are always there. Some of this story seems to me long past, but some parts live as if they occurred yesterday. The basic elements of this story are not unusual. It was the early 1980s. I was in my first few years of practice in my hometown in southwest Louisiana on weekend call. I was called to the ICU. A young man was to be pronounced brain dead. He was 18. Yes, he was brain dead from a closed head injury. The only family available was his 20-year-old brother. They were Iranians, both engineering students at the local university. Despite my expectations of language and cultural barriers, the elder brother was well-spoken, intelligent, and calm. A group of students had piled into a pickup truck with much too much alcohol. The patient was in the bed of the truck and fell out as the truck was moving. I explained to his brother that the patient was brain dead and what that meant. I explained that he should be removed from the ventilator. I don't recall if he asked any questions. I do recall that he understood. He said we should wait until his parents could travel from Iran to see their son one last time. Perhaps two evenings later, I was called back to the ICU because the parents had arrived. I was tired and I knew exactly what was going to happen. I was going to explain the situation to the family. They would agree to termination of support after the farewells, I would be left alone with the patient. I would disconnect him from the ventilator and then go down to the doctor's lounge to wait the hour or so it would take for the teenager's heart to stop. I would then pronounce him dead. The parents spoke no English. The father wore a business suit. The mother wore traditional dress. I remember green silk-like material. They were bought short by American standards. They stood at their son's deathbed in a foreign country and yet maintained a quiet, tormented, sorrowful dignity. Through the older brother, I explained the situation. I remember that we spoke in the patient's ICU room and that the nurse was present. I finished my explanation and answered what few questions there were. The family agreed that their son should be taken off the ventilator. They wanted a few more minutes with him. Then the important thing happened. The mother walked to the foot of the bed and held onto her son's feet as she cried. I remember tears hitting his feet. She used her shawl to wipe the tears from his feet, maybe a purplish shawl. I turned to the nurse, what is she doing? The nurse whispered to me, she is giving him permission to die. Suddenly and relentlessly, his heart rate, which had been perfectly steady at 80 to 90 for days since the injury, began to slow and within five minutes, he had no pulse. While still being ventilated, the normal heart of an 18-year-old boy stopped within minutes of his mother crying onto his feet, perhaps giving him permission to die. Nothing in my training prepared me to see something so obviously inexplicable within a scientific framework. The few times that I have told this story, people just stared and struggled for words. I recall these events with the, 
quiet joy. They reassure me that there is more to our profession than mere science. We give so much of ourselves in order to be physicians, and we are given much in return. As neurologists, we are privileged to see things that are so rare, so unutterably beautiful, that they leave us mute. Friends, that is indeed a sad story, but nevertheless, it is what we in the field of medicine often encounter. We may not see the exact situation like this, but we see, and all of us, uh, everyone, is not just within the healthcare professionals, we all see areas that you see the interaction between medicine and spirituality, and we cannot explain it. There is no scientific you know, method or pathophysiology to understand what happens in these situations. But nevertheless, those are things that do happen. We all know, I guess Albert Einstein is the most intelligent person in our time that I know of. And according to him, not everything that can be measured is important, and not everything that is important can be measured. So just because there are things that we cannot explain scientifically does not mean that they don't exist, and it does not mean that they're not important. It's just that our knowledge at the time, our understanding, is not to the point that we can explain those situations. That is an area that unfortunately is not being uh, explored enough within the today's society. Yet, when you actually talk to people, that is something that they would like to know more about. In a study that was published in, again, one of those medical journals, they interviewed 1,000 people and asked them about their relationship of spirituality to their well-being. And up to close to 80% of those patients responded that they believe that spiritual faith could help them recover from their disease. This is what people believe. And they also thought that 63% of them wanted their physicians to delve into that a bit more. Now, I can tell you in reality that does not happen. There are many cases that, you know, despite physicians wanting to get involved in those situations, that doesn't happen. And there are good reasons for that. I mean, one most important one is actually the fact that physicians, the way our society is put together and the way the medical education goes are not equipped to handle those situations. They're not trained to talk about spirituality. Um, you know, I can tell you out of the, you know, sometimes my patients, people ask, how long did it take you to become a neurologist? And I say, okay, well, you know, 14 years after high school. And I tell you out of those 14 years, the number of hours that we actually discussed spirituality, ethics, humanity, in medical school was probably a handful. I mean, that's an area that is really felt outside of what physicians and what healthcare professionals need to get into. The other point is that, for good reasons, doctors or healthcare professionals believe that by doing that, they are crossing boundaries. They're afraid that they may put their own beliefs into uh, or enforce that into patients. And that can be correct as well. It's just that with the right kind of training, we hopefully would be able to overcome that. Now, what is the view of Baha'i faith in terms of the body and in its interaction with the spirituality and interaction with the divine being? I have this quote from the Bob, for those of you who do not know, is the uh, herald of the Baha'i faith. And he had a selection, he describes the purpose of human body. He refers to it as a throne of the inner temple. Bob writes, at this physical frame is the throne of the inner temple. Whatever occurs to the former is felt by the latter. In reality, that which takes delight in joy or is saddened by pain is the inner temple of the body. So the inner temple being the soul and the body being the throne where the soul exists or sits, not the body itself. Since this physical body is the throne whereon the inner temple is established, God hath ordained that the body be preserved to the extent possible, so that nothing 
that causes repugnance may be experienced. The inner temple belongeth its physical frame, which is its throne. Thus, if the latter is accorded respect, it is as if the former is the recipient. The converse is likewise true. So this signifies the importance of human body. It is where the soul exists and where the soul is the throne of the soul. And it does points the interaction between the two. If you hurt one, the illness of one will definitely affect the other. The joy of one will affect the other as well. And further, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, writes, you should not neglect your health, but consider it the means by which enables you to serve. Well, the purpose of keeping our body healthy is to be able to use that body to serve mankind. We know as Baha'is that service is worship. So the purpose of keeping body healthy is to be able to um, use our body to serve mankind for the betterment of the world. Now this also brings us to another principle of the Baha'i faith, which is the harmony between science and religion. Religion and science are like two wings upon which man's intelligence can soar into the heights with which the human soul can progress. It is not possible to fly with one wing alone. Should a man try to fly with one wing of religion alone, he would quickly fall into quagmire of superstition. Whilst on the other hand, with the wing of science alone, he would also make no progress but fall into the despair of sloth of materialism. And friends, that's where, unfortunately, that's where we are now. We concentrate only on one aspect of health and medicine in relation to spirituality. We try to only look at scientific methods of dealing with disease and forgetting about what the other aspect of, um, of the whole well-being is. One by itself is not enough. It doesn't matter if it's science or religion or spirituality. Neither one by itself. They both need to go hand in hand. And that brings us to Abdul Baha's writing on types of healing, and I'd like to read this quote for you. There are two ways of healing sickness, material means and spiritual means. Again, talking the two aspects that are important in spirituality and healing. The first is by the treatment of physician. The second consists in praying to God and in turning to him. Both means should be used and practiced. Illness which occur by reason of physical causes should be treated by doctors with medical remedies. Those which are due to spiritual causes disappear through spiritual means. Thus, an illness caused by affliction, fear, nervous impressions will be healed more effectively by spiritual rather than by physical treatments. Hence, both kinds of treatments should be followed. They are not contradictory. God who hath revealed and made manifest medical science so that his servants may profit from this kind of treatment also. Thou shouldst give equal attention, equal attention to spiritual treatments for they produce marvelous effects. Again, emphasizing the fact that there are two sides to the story. There is the spiritual aspect and there is the physical or scientific aspect. Now, if thou wishes to know the true remedy which will heal from the old sickness and will give him to the health of the divine kingdom now that it is the precepts and teachings of God. Guard them sacredly. Now how does that relate in scientific realm? Do we have any area that actually, anyone that has actually looked at this scientifically to see if this is true? Well, in some cases, yes. It has actually been studied more in the field of mental health. I'll just show you this one article that, uh, that, uh, that again is from one of the medical journals. In this study, they basically looked at the association between spirituality and religion and mental health. They looked at patients that had various mental illnesses, anywhere from depression to anxiety to um, various uh, adjustment disorder. And they looked at which one of these uh, patients have, are connected with spirituality and, and, and religion and you know, what, who is not. And what they found was that there was a significant difference in those patients 
that actually had a connection to a, to a faith-based uh, group. They, 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 in, they involved the spirituality in their life. And this showed that, yes, there is a connection. This is another, I guess, one of many examples that how scientifically we can actually see how spirituality can actually affect men, uh, mental illness, which is what we usually think of it as a, as a physical, uh, scientific uh, illness. Now, we, do, we still don't know how this happens. The pathophysiology of this is not known. We don't know how spirituality can actually fix depression or how spirituality can fix uh, various medical conditions. But the proof is there. Now, when we go beyond mental health, how about other conditions such as heart attacks, such as lung disease, kidney uh, dysfunction, uh, cancer. Well, again, there are various studies that have looked at those. So this one in particular, they looked at religion and spirituality and the risk of developing coronary artery disease or heart attacks. And they have looked at uh, about 300 patients that were included in that trial. And what they found was that religion and spirituality were associated with a significantly decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, emphasizing how there is a connection between spirituality and, and health, specifically in areas that we don't think of. How would you know, being spiritual help you uh, have lower risk of heart attacks or cardiovascular disease? We don't know. But when you look at the numbers, there is definitely a trend that those are areas that ha have actually been shown to be helpful. Same thing in, um, in this trial, when they looked at quality of life in patients that had lung disease. And they found that those were connected with spirituality that had considered themselves at least religion or they were connected to the supernatural and the divine being. They actually did better and they had a better quality of life. Now, Abdul Baha talks about a concept of balance and homeostasis. Now, for those of uh, you who are familiar with medical technology, homeostasis is something that we use all the time. That's the primary purpose of, um, of uh, medical uh, treatments is to keep homeostasis within human body. And that means anywhere from making sure that there is the right balance of uh, acidity in the blood, there is the right balance of electrolytes, there is the right uh, balance of neurotransmitters within the brain. So in within the scientific uh, I guess, uh, organizations, the homeostasis or this balance certainly exists. And that's what Abdul Baha also refers to. And I'd like to read you this quote. He says, the outer physical causal factors in disease, however, is disturbance in the balance. The proportionate equilibrium of all those elements of which the human body is composed, so long as these constituents remain in their due proportion, according to the national balance of the whole. That is, no component suffereth a change in national proportion degree and balance, no component being either augmented or decreased. There will be no physical cause for the incursion of disease. So when we have that homeostasis, when we have that balance within the body, then there won't be disease. Now, however, Abdul Baha goes a step further. He says, not only do we need balance of constituents within the body, but we also need another balance, another homeostasis. When the material world and the divine world are well correlated, when the hearts become heavenly and the aspirations become pure and divine, perfect connection shall take place. Then shall this power produce a perfect manifestation. Physical and spiritual diseases will then receive absolute healing. So again, there should be a balance between physical world and the spiritual and the divine world. Once we achieve that, then we will have no disease. We will have both in terms of the spirituality and in terms of physical. Now, how important is the science of medicine? Why is that given? Why are we talking about it? Well, Baha'u'llah has revealed that science of medicine is the noblest science that human being has ever been able to develop. I mean, that's very powerful. It's the most noblest science that human being has ever been able to develop. So for those 
young ones in the audience who are thinking about careers, I mean, I highly suggest this. Um, now, we have granted you permission to study such sciences as will benefit you, not those sciences which will lead to idle disputes. Better is this for you, did ye but know. And again, Abdul Baha has written, you should endeavor to study the science of medicine, strive day and night that you may become highly qualified in the science. And when you wish to dispense treatment, set your hearts toward the Abha kingdom in treating divine confirmation. Now that point is something that I will talk about again later. That, that is one of the responsibilities of the physician is that you have to rely, to not only are you responsible to provide medical treatment, but at the same time you have to act as a channel of transforming that divine um, I guess, uh, confirmation to the patients. And that's when you will have the benefit of the, both worlds. You will act both in terms of scientific and the spiritual um, responsibilities that physicians have and need to provide. Now, again, in Baha'i faith, there is significant emphasis put on seeking medical advice. Um, for those of you who may know, Baha'u'llah has written many books and has revealed thousands of tablets. But there is one book, which is the Book of Law, or the most holy book, the Kitab al Akdas, where most, I guess if you think that the Baha'is are, you know, um, uh, have to follow, are in that book. And one important issue that has actually been in the Kitab al-Aqdas is the importance of seeking medical advice. Baha'u'llah writes in Kitab al-Aqdas, resort ye in times of sickness to competent physicians. We have not set aside the use of material means, rather, than, rather have we confirmed it through this pen, which God hath made to be the dawning place of his shining and glorious cause. So in the most holy book, Baha'is are instructed to seek medical advice when there is a need to. Abdul Baha further says, according to the explicit decree of Baha'u'llah, one must not turn aside from the advice of a competent doctor. It is imperative to consult one, even if the patient himself be a well-known and eminent physician. So none of us can get away with that. In short, the point is that you should maintain your health by consulting a highly skilled physician. So that again emphasizes that we cannot just rely on spiritual means and we cannot just rely on, on scientific and physical. There is a balance and we have to use both in that, um, uh, in that endeavor. Now just a few words about nutrition. Um, again, this is another area that unfortunately uh, medical community does not get much training in. Um, as important as it is, uh, there are not uh, you know, many uh, sessions or, uh, or uh, opportunities for doctors to learn about nutrition. Also, the way our society is put together, the, the, uh, the way that pharmaceutical companies are, uh, and rightly so, I guess, to some extent, because of the profit, all of the studies and all of the trials and all of the investigations are being done in terms of pharmacological ways of treating patients, drugs, to the expense of nutrition and herbs and uh, other supplements. Now, there are a lot of stuff are out there. Um, I mean, I guess we, one has to be careful not to uh, believe that whatever is, uh, is natural and, and food product is safe, but at the same time, it is something that needs to be explored. It's an area that should be looked at. Um, as Baha, as Abdul Baha has written, the food of the future will be fruits and grains. The time will come when meat will no longer be eaten. Medical science is only in its infancy, yet, it has shown that our natural food is that which grows out of the ground. So a time will come where we will all be vegetarians. Uh, we're not there yet. I think the advantage of that and the scientific reasoning behind that is still 
not developed, but I think that's where the society will go. Will, will go. The Bob also has written that the people of Baha must develop the science of medicine to such a degree that they will heal illness by means of foods. And Abdul Baha says, it is possible to cure by foods, elements, and fruits. But as today, the science of medicine is imperfect because we don't have the scientific knowledge. We haven't done the studies. We don't know which health food or which food or which grain is beneficial and which one is not. This fact is not yet fully grasped. When the science of medicine reaches perfection, treatment will be given by foods, elements, fragrant fruits, and vegetables, and by various waters, hot and cold in temperature. So hopefully, as we grow as a society and, and as scientific uh, uh, developments come to fruition, then we will have better understanding of that. Now, just a few words about power of prayer. Um, you know, that is a topic on its own. You could, you know, spend one of these nights discussing the, just the power of prayer. But as we all know, there is importance in the, in the prayer in terms of uh, healing and well-being. Uh, Abdu'l-Baha has written, the prayers which were revealed to ask for healing apply both to physical and spiritual healing. Recite them then to heal both the soul and the body. If healing is right for the patient, it will certainly be granted. But for some ailing persons, healing would only be the cause of other ills, and therefore wisdom does not permit an affirmative answer to the prayer. So don't be disheartened if you pray for something and it doesn't come through. That may not be the right thing. Uh, you know, they, there may be other reasons for that, but nevertheless, we all know the power of prayer. However, that's not enough on its own. Shoghi Effendi has said, Baha'u'llah has ordained that in case of illness, we should always consult the most competent physician. Again, the competent physician comes into place again. And this is exactly what the guardian strongly advises you to do, for prayer alone is not sufficient. So we should not just rely on praying to, you know, to heal the, the cut or to take care of cancer. I think they both need to go together. Prayer is important, but at the same time, seeking medical advice and seeing a competent physician and following what has scientifically been proven to be helpful is, is important as well. Now that brings me to what, what is the responsibilities of uh, physicians? Uh, sure, it is a noble profession, it is a noble science, but with that comes responsibilities. Baha'u'llah writes, or Abdu'l-Baha writes, O thou distinguished physician, praise be to God that thou hast two powers, one to undertake physical healing and the other is spiritual healing. Matters related to man's spirit have a great effect on his bodily condition. For instance, thou shouldst impart gladness to thy patients. That's very important. I don't think... I have done that many times, to actually make my patients glad, to make them comfortable, to make them not just give them medicine, but to actually provide them with um, comfort and joy when they leave. And bring them to ecstasy and exaltation. How often hath it occurred that this has, hath caused early recovery? Therefore, treat thou sick with both powers. Spiritual feelings have a surprising effect on healing nervous ailment. And then Abdul Baha further says, O thou sincere servant of the true one and spiritual physician of people, whenever thou attendeth the patient, turn thy face toward the Lord of the kingdom. Supplicate assistant from the Holy Spirit and heal the ailment of the sick one. Again, relying on both powers that we have. Now Baha'u'llah has revealed a very important tablet in relation to medicine. It's called the Tablet of Medicine, or the Lohatep. This was revealed by Baha'u'llah in his early days of uh, arriving in Akka. And it was addressed to a uh, Persian doctor who was trained in Eastern traditional school of medicine. Now, in this tablet, Baha'u'llah talks about various 
do's and don'ts, if you will, of what we should and shouldn't do. Now, some of those have already been um, explored scientifically, and the, the validity, obviously, has been proven. Some of those are yet to, to be done. And I would like to just go over a few of those points that Baha'u'llah makes in the Tablet of Medicine. Baha'u'llah says, say, O people, eat not except after having hunger, hungered, and drink not after retiring to sleep. So essentially, only eat when you're hungry. Don't eat when your stomach is full. And we also don't need water in the middle of the night. I mean, make sure you drink plenty of water during the day, but when you go to bed, you don't need water throughout the night. How beneficial is exercise when one's stomach is empty for through, through it, the limbs become strengthened? And how dark a calamity is exercise when one's stomach is full? Now, we know this scientifically. In our body, blood is circulated to various organs. Now, how much blood goes to each organ depends on how much energy that organ at that particular time requires. So if you're exercising, there is more blood that goes to the extremities. If you, are, if you just ate, a lot of blood goes to the gastrointestinal system. And at night when you're sleeping, a lot of uh, blood uh, cardiac output goes to your brain and that helps lay down new memories and, and to brain to recover from day-to-day -day activities of, of the day. So the amount of blood that's circulated in each area of the body depends on what you're doing. Now imagine if you have just eaten, you have a stomach full of food, the blood needs to go to stomach to be helping to digest the food and then all of a sudden you go and do a 5K run and all of that blood is taken to the extremities. That's you know, one of those areas that science has actually now found the reason of why Baha'u'llah said these 150 years ago. Baha'u'llah also says, do not avoid medical treatment when thou hast need of it, but abandon it when thy constitution has been restored. So there is no reason to continue to take tablets if you're healed. Do not commence a meal except after full digestion and swallow not save after the completion of chewing. So make sure you chew your food properly before you swallow. Treat an illness, firstly with nutrients, and proceed not onto medications or immediately. Again, emphasizing the importance of nutrition, of what we eat. Now, if that doesn't get you what you need, then definitely uh, medication would be of uh, importance. If food of opposite dispositions are available at the table, do not mix them. Under such circumstances, content themselves with but one of them. So if there are many different types of uh, food, make sure that you don't mix so many of them. Commence first with the light food before moving on to the heavier one and with liquid before the solid. So again, there are many other uh, points in the tablet of medicine. Uh, it's a very powerful tablet and I highly recommend it, especially for people who are in the health of, uh, you know, in the field of medicine to, uh, to review that. Now friends, it goes without saying that the science of medicine, as Abdul Baha has said, is still in the condition of infancy and it has not reached its mat maturity. There is a lot that we still need to explore. The interaction between science and medicine, the interaction of, or, or the uh, education of healthcare professionals, how to deal with those situ situations, how we can address these shortcomings. But as Abdul Baha has said, we are still in the, in the infancy of, of the period. The science is still has a lot to learn and hopefully as time goes on and as we learn more about this, we can address those shortcomings. Now at the end, I would like to finish by reading you this. Many of you are familiar with this. This is again another uh, prayer that actually was part of the Lohatep or uh, Tablet of Medicine. It was translated by the Guardian. Um, and uh, Baha'is, you, you know, refer to that as the healing prayer. And I would like to uh, finish tonight's um, 
at least uh, this part of the uh, discussion by reading you this tablet from Baha'u'llah. Thy name is my healing, O my God, and remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope, and love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily art the all-bountiful, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Baha'u'llah. Thank you.